right, good afternoon uh, or good evening everyone and uh, welcome to my continued series on uh, themes of the 20th century. Um, this lecture of course is going to focus pretty much uh, entirely on the Khrushchev period of the Soviet Union. Uh, the last lecture before this one would be uh, the Cold War in Europe 1945 to 49. Now that is not to suggest that the years between 1949 and 1956 were not important, but as I say, we're going to focus on um, sort of uh, you know the leadership specifically of Nikita Khrushchev and, and what he had to confront during this uh, very intense period of the Cold War. In 1953, Joseph Stalin would pass away and you know there's a lot of conspiracy theories that perhaps he'd been uh, poisoned or murdered and so forth. Um, there's also some really interesting anecdotal stories about uh, his death. One in particular I always like to tell the students to what degree this has been exaggerated in film or in literature or in history. I'm not entirely sure but uh, it still uh, says a lot about the power of Stalin. And apparently on his deathbed in 1953, all his close comrades were on his deathbed and the doctor was there and they were all standing around the bed, you know, crocodile tears. Um, and the doctor pronounces Joseph Stalin dead and one of the people on the, uh, in the room, I guess, collapses to his knees and says, Finally, you SOB, you good-for-nothing, bad human being, good riddance. And I guess when he got up, Stalin, his eyes opened and he was alive and he glared at this fellow who again collapsed to the ground and begged forgiveness from Joseph Stalin who would then promptly die a second time, only this time for good. Um, it's really hard to uh, imagine the scope of, of this man's impact on the Soviet Union from 1928-1953. He had dragged the Russian people through the tragedies of the purges, of collectivization, famine in the Ukraine. Um, he did get them through the Second World War. And he, always, he also was the architect of the Soviet behavior in the early part of the Cold War as well. So when he dies, there's this sort of collective uh, mourning. And, you know, it's interesting when you look at clips or photographs of you know, factory workers crying or people in the streets crying. One has to wonder to what extent are they crying because their great leader has passed away or to what extent is it sort of a great sort of reckoning and coming to terms with everything they had endured during the Stalin period. Uh, and it's an interesting thing. Same kind of phenomenon of course happens in China in 1976 when Mao Zedong dies. You know, was it relief? Was it sadness? Was it a bit of both? Who knows? But when Stalin dies, of course, for a man that had such a tremendous uh, legacy and a long 25-year leadership career in the Soviet Union, the, one has to beg the question, who's going to lead from there? And there was a certain degree, certainly, of shuffling and jockeying for power, but by 1956, on top of the pile would end up uh, this man here, Nikita Khrushchev, very famous moment of him at the United Nations banging his shoe, saying, I believe he said something to the effect of, we will bury you. Um, so he is our guy right here. Uh, here's some other pictures, of course, of uh, the building of the Berlin Wall, which will be part of this discussion. Uh, Fidel Castro, back in the days when he still smoked cigars, I believe he quit in the late 70s. And here's a picture of a tank. Uh, I think this is during the um, Hungarian uprising of 1956. So a lot of action occurring during this period of the Cold War. But let's go back and try to piece together who this Nikita Khrushchev was because in many ways he uh, really changes the landscape of how people perceive the Soviet Union because he certainly was a very different kind of character than Joseph Stalin. So he was born in 1894 and spent his early years as a metal worker. Good uh, uh, job to be in when you're looking uh, at uh, strong working class roots uh, when you rise up in the Communist Party. That was always an asset, of course. I mean, yes, they had their share of intellectuals, but you know, people like Stalin and Khrushchev were truly poor or working class uh, individuals who grew up in working class families or poor families. 
which can be deemed as an asset when you're looking for leadership uh, in a communist country. He joined the Bolsheviks in 1918 and became a political commissar during the Russian Civil War. So it's interesting that he joined the Bolsheviks after the revolution. You know, in some cases that could be a liability. Um, for him, the good fortune was that it didn't become a liability. Uh, he was involved, of course, in engineering later. Uh, he developed the Moscow Metro and was awarded the Order of Lenin in 1935 as a result of his efforts in coordinating and helping design this incredible network um, in Moscow. Uh, so he was kind of moving up inch by inch, little by little. To what extent in 35 he was looking for leadership, I, I don't think that was on his radar yet. Certainly by the middle 1930s most people are just finding a way to stay out of trouble and to uh, avoid the ever watchful eye of the, of the state of the Soviet Union who were just on the verge of uh, the Great Purges. So Now, I'm a bit conflicted about this comment where I say Khrushchev assisted in the purge of many friends and colleagues in Moscow. Um, we don't know precise details about his role in the purges. You know, sometimes by being silent, uh, as many were, you are actively involved in something that is out of control. The purges were out of control. People were turning people in. And I think, and I'm not apologizing for Khrushchev or his behavior, but I would imagine that he, like many at this time, did whatever they could, uh, not only to keep their job and their position, but quite literally to stay alive. And if you become part of the mechanism of the purges, perhaps that could be, be deemed as a better place to be than on the receiving end of the purges. Now, you have to consider that in this incredible climate of fear that existed during the Great Purges, uh, where hundreds of thousands were either executed or sent to uh, the gulags in Siberia, um, Perhaps the best way to look at this is to put uh, Khrushchev in that camp of doing what he needed to survive and to what extent he relished this job, to what extent he enjoyed or felt completely vindicated in turning people in, that I don't know and I don't know if history can ever know those kind of details. Uh, certainly there's a lot of uh, history coming out on a regular basis and the wonderful thing with history is that we're constantly learning new material and new anecdotes and new stories about the character of these people but it, it's fair to say that uh, Khrushchev was probably one of those who was part of something that uh, he was part of simply in order to maintain his own survival and his own place within the Soviet regime. So. In late 1937, Stalin appointed Khrushchev as the head of the Communist Party in Ukraine. So this was, of course, a huge um, uh, bump in his uh, place in, in the Communist Party apparatus. Um, we know that Joseph Stalin liked Khrushchev because Khrushchev was sort of a gregarious, humorous, slap-you-on-the-back, guitar-chomping, funny guy. He had a great sense of humor. And I think that if you could, you know, we talked in the last lecture about navigating your relationship around Stalin, because you always, always had to be careful, you know, you didn't want him to think you're up to something. If you're too quiet, he might worry about what you're doing. If you were sucking up to him too much, he might go, why are you trying so hard? You know, and I think someone like Khrushchev was just able to be the life of the party, the funny man. And I think Stalin really quite enjoyed that. So we know that Stalin liked Khrushchev and that um, they developed a fairly good relationship. And like I say, that's a much better uh, place to be in than on the butt end of the purges. So, you know, it's a very difficult time for sure. Uh, he would have tremendous success in, uh, be in, in his involvement in the Stalingrad battle, which we've looked at in our three-part series on the Second World War, and he would continue to rise in the Communist Party. So, by the time Stalin dies in 1953, Nikita Khrushchev is in a very, very good position um, to assert his uh, uh, control of, of, the poli of, of the Communist Party, that is, in the Soviet Union. All right.
So by the time he finally rises to the top, um, not only are the Soviet people wondering how the Soviet Union is going to move forward, but certainly those in the West, particularly the United States, looked at Khrushchev with a keen eye and trying to suss out where's this guy going to go? What will this mean for the Cold War? What will this mean for Soviet and American or Soviet and Western uh, relationships in the future? And as we said, Stalin dies in 53 and after three years of shuffling, Khrushchev becomes the leader of the USSR. Um, his first goal for Khrushchev is de something he calls de-Stalinization, which is his very broad program, which means a more reasonable way of government. Now you have to consider a couple of things. That people within the Communist Party were either very, very loyal to Stalin and, and his methods, or very critical but quiet. And I don't think you really had a lot of people that were willing to come out and oppose Stalin, certainly while he was alive. I think what Khrushchev recognizes is that there was something very, very toxic um, about Stalin's leadership. Now, he wasn't going to throw Stalin under the bus for everything, but I think Khrushchev recognized that in order for the Soviet Union to move forward, we need to come to terms with our very difficult past. So um, I think the program of destalinization was part of that reckoning, if you will, of coming to terms with the past. His program of destalinization, there's Khrushchev again here, um, was outlined in the 20th Party Congress. Here's a picture of that very Congress of the Communist Party and the terms of the goal and, and terms and goals were this. The 20th Party Congress is where Khrushchev basically outlines what his economic foreign policy domestic goals are for the next X amount of time. And here we go. Number one. Boy, <clears throat> did this ruffle some feathers. The recognition of Stalin's crimes during the purges of 1934 to 38. This is where I find it interesting when we look back and try to quantify his role in the purges, because here he was, very willing to go against the grain. There were conservatives within the Communist Party that were absolutely mortified by Khrushchev coming to terms with this, but basically he felt this was important. We need to acknowledge and recognize that our great leader had committed tremendous crimes on the Russian people. Uh, oh. It gets covered by the picture, sorry about that, but it says a criticism of Stalin's forced collectivization is what's supposed to be there. Um, we talked about this in the last lecture that forced collectivization was state controlled agriculture, that is uh, the state taking complete control and of course it, it, it completely turned the agricultural industry upside down. There were tremendous protests, uh, particularly in the Ukraine, and part of what leads to the Ukrainian famine of 1932 and 33 is Stalin's desire to punish the Ukraine as a whole for their resisting of collectivization. So collectivization was extremely contentious, it was brutal, it was, um, it was extremely unpopular, and it was forced upon the Russian people whether they liked it or not. So uh, <clears throat> Khrushchev said we need to recognize that this was a mistake. Uh, let me just, I'm going to move this picture over. Give me a second here. I think it might be good if we, uh, let's have a look here. Well, no, we can leave that. I can read you the note. What it says here is um, a condemnation of Stalin's personality cult. Okay. The condemnation of Stalin's personality cult. What exactly does that mean? Um, everywhere you looked in the Soviet Union, there was a picture of Stalin. Every town had a statue. Every school had a portrait. Everywhere you looked, there was Stalin. Stalin was the last person people thought about when they went to bed and the first person they thought about when they got up in the morning. Stalin was everywhere, and usually the statues, he was, he was big and tall and strong and perfect, you know, when in fact he was, 
you know, he had a pockmarked face, he was quite small in stature, I think he was five foot four. He was unable to use his left arm because of an accident as a young man. I mean, he was by no means a perfect um, uh, individual, but certainly the cult of personality projected him as this, uh, this uh, all-powerful, all-knowing, god-like figure. Nikita Khrushchev says personality cults are not good for healthy societies. So he's really, in this 20th Party Congress, stripping away a lot of the major tenets of Stalinism. You will. All right, so the goal that Khrushchev had in line was something that he called peaceful coexistence. Now, basically, what this means is that overtly the Communist Party of the, of the Soviet Union no longer was their primary goal to destroy and overthrow all capitalist economies. It was the recognition that the Communist world was becoming very well established and growing, by the way, at this time, and the capitalist world was well established and well entrenched. So instead of saying our ultimate goal is to destroy you all, our goal is to come to terms with you and learn to live together. Now that does not mean that the Soviet Union does not continue to support countries in the developing world who are now, uh, you know, departing from the yoke of colonialism and looking for non-Western alternatives. So the communist appeal was pretty uh, strong in the third world. So um, supporting developing countries, as we said, recently decolonized. Um, and as a result of fairly active Soviet support in poor peasant-based countries, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, the president at the time, from 1953 to 1960, would develop something called the domino theory to explain his concerns in Indochina and beyond. Now, I don't know how well you can see this picture here, um, <clears throat> but you've got Bangladesh domino, India, Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. Here you have the first domino falling, and if Vietnam falls, then they're all going to fall. It's a similar metaphor to the bacteria, the spreading of communism, the dominoes falling. It's like once it gets out of control there will be no stopping it. What's interesting about the spreading of communism thesis and also the domino theory is that it fails to really come to terms with why this might be the case and what can we do to prevent it. Um, and you know when we look back at the Marshall Plan I, I still always really look at the Marshall Plan as something that the Americans did that really uh, worked very, very well. And it certainly had long-term benefits for the American economy as well. So it's interesting that we've got this sort of um, idea that, you know, if we don't stop it now, it's just going to spin out of control. Well, let's identify what the problems are that allow this to happen and maybe fix it. This is a period, and you know, American foreign policy has always kind of had a tendency to look at things as very simplistic, um, right or wrong answers. You're either with us or you're against us. You're either good or you're bad. You're either a, d a democracy or a totalitarian state. You know, foreign policy explanations in simplistic terms uh, did a great service to American policymakers because it could basically explain things, very complex problems and very simple uh, gestures that people could understand. So the tendency during the Cold War was to continue that sort of bacteria imagery of the spreading of communism, the domino theory, freedom versus tyranny, and so on and so forth. So uh, much of American, even to this day, uh, American policymakers use those sort of black and white terms to boil complex problems down into digestible forms. Domestically, Khrushchev recognized that the Soviet Union had been at a war footing since the revolution of 1917. There had been a constant, constant upheaval in Russia's life from the 17 revolution to the civil war to the famine to the Stalin years, the purges, collectivization, World War II, my gosh, the early Cold War. It just seems to me that, you know, eventually the Russian people are going to be going, geez, you know, this communist business, we've had a pretty rough go for the last 40 years. When are things going to chill out and get a little better? And I think Khrushchev recognized that um, they needed to somehow focus on uh, providing things for the Russian people that made their lives easier. So he's beginning to look at uh, 
consumer goods, televisions, refrigerators, basically raising the Russian standard of living because they've been at a war footing for so long it was time to produce the virtues and the, and the wealth, well, maybe that's the wrong word for communism, but uh, produce good things for the Russian people to enjoy. There was a thaw in the rigid nature of Russian society, there's no question about that, that things began to kind of soften a bit. Uh, Russian students are traveling overseas to study, uh, you know, university students studying Slavic studies or Russian studies are going to Moscow and studying there. So there's a little bit of openness that begins to occur that didn't exist before then. <clears throat> What's interesting is the impact that Khrushchev's peaceful coexistence, his thaw and tensions, de-Stalinization. If you are living in Hungary, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, and other of the Eastern Bloc, Soviet-controlled countries of Eastern Europe, you're thinking, hey, wait a second here, this guy is pretty laid back, he's pretty open-minded. Maybe, just maybe, we can now kind of escape from the more rigid Stalinist elements of our Soviet-backed and supported uh, communist government in our country. So it's not surprising that there were people in the Eastern Bloc who saw in Khrushchev maybe an opportunity to break away from the more rigid aspects of Stalinist um, government, if you will. The first evidence that the Soviets were willing to bring out the guns when they felt it was in their right to do so was in East Berlin in 1953, when a strike involving 100,000 workers in East Berlin was put down by Soviet tanks. I mean, to me, a communist government putting down a worker movement is the ultimate in ideological hypocrisy. Um, because they are claiming to represent the interests of the working class. All you have to do is read Marx, and uh, that's the central theme, supporting the workers, right? The worker and then later Lenin with the peasants and so forth. The fact that the Soviets have to put down a labor strike is pretty shocking, and maybe those workers didn't expect it themselves. Then we get to Hungary in 1956, where Hungarians demanded independence from Soviet control, they wanted free elections, and they wanted their leader out of power. The leader in Hungary at the time was a guy named Rokosi, and they didn't like him. He was hardcore, he was a yes-man to the Soviets, he was a Stalinist by nature, and the, the Hungarians demanded that he get out. The Soviets listened in, 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 at this point. They said, okay, we get it. We get that you... Uh, don't like this guy, he's a hardliner, and uh, we will then support the introduction of a new leader by the name of Naj. Now it looks like it's pronounced Nagy, and, uh, but I had a Hungarian woman recently tell me that no, it's pronounced Naj. So I think I've got it now. But uh, the Soviets would install this Naj character as a new leader, but what Naj didn't tell the Soviets when they put him in power was that he wanted to withdraw from the Warsaw Pact and establish greater freedoms. You know, to what extent the Soviets didn't do their homework on this guy, or to what extent there was information that uh, certainly Naj didn't tell the Soviets that, oh, hey, if you appoint me, I'm going to do ABC. He obviously decided that now he was the official leader, he's going to do these things. Well, the Soviets were mortified that Naj would move in this direction. As a result, the Soviet tanks rolled in and crushed the revolt with 27,000 dead, 200, um, 20,000 were imprisoned, once again covered again, sorry by the picture, and uh, 200,000, I believe, Hungarians fled abroad. So, pretty amazing uh, the impact. And the Soviets demonstrated in Hungary that they were willing to bring in the tanks and kill people on the streets who were trying to, to move away from the Soviet orbit. So, so in many ways, Hungary becomes a lesson to all the other countries in um, Europe to, to say, look, don't even think about it. Um, and boy, that message was made loud and clear. And uh, so Hungary was very much a tragedy. And those 200,000 that fled abroad, many came to Canada as well. So.
All right. Well, of all the hot spots of the Cold War during uh, the Khrushchev period, it would have to be, of course, Berlin would be center stage during this. Um, it's kind of a Berlin is kind of like the epicenter, if you will, of the Cold War during this period. In 1958, Berlin was very tense. West was doing very well economically, and the East was not doing well at all. Well. You know, this is, these are the days when Berliners could travel back and forth. And if you were living in East Berlin and you had a, a burned out old apartment and a low paying job, all you had to do was get on the train and head over to um, Zoologische Garden, which is kind of the center point of um, West Berlin. And Alexanderplatz, I believe, was the center of East Berlin. You travel by 10 minutes on a train and you walk into West Berlin and say, wow, look at all this color, look at all this these great consumer goods. I mean, it, it didn't take rocket science to figure out which of the two Berlins was doing better. So, as a result of this difficult situation, the Soviets, as we know from the Berlin blockade, wanted to push the West out of Berlin. Um, and the Soviets would, would make, you know, comments about their desire to do this, then they would back down. Um, Khrushchev and Eisenhower would agree to have kind of a summit, if you will, about um, about the Berlin crisis, if you will, and try to come up with an agreement of some kind. But uh, the the summit where they were going to meet in Paris to discuss the Berlin issue would be cancelled because a U-2 spy plane was shot down over the USSR, piloted by an American named Gary Powers, who was hired. Uh, to fly over and take pictures of the Soviet Union. And, you know, I mean, the reality was is that these two countries were spying on each other on a regular basis. So the Soviets certainly should have been surprised at um, the fact that the Americans did this because the Soviets were doing the same kind of thing. Eisenhower refused to apologize for the, um, the uh, spy plane incident. And Khrushchev says, fine, if you're not going to apologize, I'm not going to meet in Paris to discuss the Berlin situation. So, you know, there's a fairly direct link between this U-2 spy plane incident and the eventual desire by the Soviet Union to support the GDR in building a wall. Um, a lot of these uh, events are quite uh, remarkably told in a film called Bridge of Spies. Uh, another Steven Spielberg film, if you're interested in this middle Cold War period, it's a really great film to watch to give you some of the, the, the look and texture of, of Berlin at this time and these events. So, uh, Kennedy comes to power in 1960, but there are no resolutions with Khrushchev. You know, when, when, uh, when, when um, uh, John F. Kennedy comes to power, I believe he was 42, 43 years old. Uh, he came from a wealthy family. Uh, and Khrushchev kind of thought, well, here's this young guy, good-looking guy, baby-pampered, Ivy League character. I can push him around. Um, you know, I'm the older, more experienced, fatherly type of character. And I think Nikita Khrushchev goes into his first meeting with Kennedy just to make it very clear who's in charge. And uh, that meeting, I think it was in Vienna in 1961. 6061, I'd have to look again. Uh, Kennedy was like white as a ghost when he got out of the meeting because he couldn't believe how, how, how you know, tough this Soviet leader was. In 1961, by 1961, over 100,000 East Germans had left for the West. Over 100,000 East Germans. All they did was get on a train and go to West Berlin and they were out. It was that simple. You know, and these were not just these were highly educated, a lot of educated people who were, who were educated in East Germany, got their educations for free, um, got their education and then fled, you know, so the East German government was pretty, pretty upset about that. Um, before this happened, there's another piece that I think is very interesting that leads to um, the uh, Soviet Union to close the border between East and West and uh, particularly Berlin, rather, I should say, is that a lot of West Berliners finally figured out that they could travel into East Germany, buy groceries at um, Soviet or, or East German government-owned shops where milk, cheese, bread, butter, the staples were much cheaper. So they would go there, load up on their goodies, and go back to West Berlin. You know, I kind of draw the metaphor. We're here in British Columbia. We had an issue where 
um, uh, people from uh, Vancouver would drive down to Bellingham, Washington to the Costco and buy up all the cheese and milk because it was so much cheaper and uh, people in Bellingham were getting upset because they're saying why do you tell those Canadians they can't come in to 12 so we can get our cheese and butter before they take, buy it all up. So it's an interesting kind of analogy and it makes me think of that every time but I think in many ways the East German government and particularly the Berlin um, government uh, in the GDR recognized that they were losing all their top people and uh, something needed to stop this bleeding out, if you will, of all their best people and all the groceries that are being purchased by uh, West Berliners who found and knew that East German groceries were cheaper. As a result, the Soviets closed the border in August 1961 between East and West Berlin and build a wall with a mined buffer zone. Uh, you know, with tensions would subside. And here you can see this wall being built. Now this is something I don't think anybody could have fathomed that the Soviets would be willing to do. And let me explain because a lot of people think the Berlin Wall was a, was a border wall between East and West Germany. That, that wasn't the case at all. If you look up at this map here, you'll see this is the overall perimeter of Greater Berlin. Everywhere around the city of Berlin is East Communist Germany. Remember that Berlin is 100 miles within, it's right smack in the middle of East Germany. So what you've got here, you've got East Germany here, West, or East Berlin and West Berlin, but all around this backside of West Berlin is East Germany. So what the East German government does is they build a wall around West Berlin. Encasing West Berlin, you can still fly in and out of West Berlin, but people cannot travel freely between these two Berlin, Berlins or from the other side, which is communist Germany, they can't get in there either. So they've kind of walled West Berlin in. Yet these people, as I said, could come and go as they please. Khrushchev believed that a wall was better than a war. Um, you know, he was right. I suppose it was better than a war. Tensions do subside because of the bleeding out of the German, uh, East Germans leaving into West Berlin had stopped. Uh, the grocery situation had stopped. So it did alleviate some of the tension and pressure, but boy, what an ugly symbol for the East German government. You, you know, you, you need a wall to keep your people out or keep your people in, whatever way you wanted to look at it. So the, the stigma of having to build a wall to prevent your people from leaving was a pretty ugly symbol. And uh, it's one that every president of the United States would exploit. Certainly Ronald Reagan would come down in 1987, I believe he said, tear down that wall. Uh, and of course, two years later, it does come down. So, Well, on the other side of the world, here we have the Cuba situation, which is an entirely different situation that existed in, um, in, in Eastern Europe. So. Cuba, of course, was considered vital to American security going way back to the Monroe Doctrine. They'd always kept an eye on it. Of course, in 1898, the Americans go to war with Spain uh, during the Spanish-American War, at which time they would take control and liberate Cuba from the Spanish. Part of that would be, I think, the Philippines they would get and other places as well. 1940, the leader at the time, a man named Bautista, took control and encouraged U.S. business to invest and the lack of regulations drew many criminal elements from the U.S. as well. The Cuban situation is pretty simple. When Batista comes into power, he tells American business that, you know, the market's open. And very wealthy individuals, whether they are legitimately wealthy or illegally wealthy, realize that Cuba was a great place to set up shop because you can make money, there were no regulations. Um, you could log your money, the mob certainly figured that out, the mob would build casinos and a lot of the casinos in Cuba were owned by the American mob at the time. So, you know, it kind of becomes a sort of a playground for Americans to go to. Most Cubans were very poor and they resented what they felt was the prostitution of Cuba. Certainly that's the way it looked. There was such a stark difference between poor Cuba and then wealthy Havana 
and most of the wealth was owned by non-Cubans. So uh, Castro rallies support and takes power in 1959. We're going to come back and look more thoroughly at Castro. Um, and initially he was nationalist, but he wanted to improve conditions and he would shut down casinos and brothels. So, you know, one of the first things Castro does is he eliminates all the ugly aspects of the Cuban experience. And of course that was very popular when he eliminated um, the brothels and the casinos. Of course he angered the mob and the mob wanted him gone. And then when he began to nationalize American business, particularly oil refineries, then the American government wanted him gone. But it's interesting that when he first took power, the word communism and socialism was not uttered from his lips. Um, that does come, though, but initially I think he was very much more in the nationalist, maybe socialist camp uh, than sort of a devout Marxist-Leninist at that point. So. So let's look at him. There he is here with Che Guevara, the Argentinian doctor who becomes kind of a central figure within the revolutionary period. There's Fidel, probably mid-late 1970s. He was born in 1926, the son of middle-class parents. Uh, he would get a degree in law and in 1950, in 1950 rather, and in 1953 would be jailed following an attempted coup over Batista. Um, at his trial, he would make his history will absolve me speech. So here's this young guy, good looking, athletic, becomes a lawyer, he's a nationalist. Um, he's completely uh, disgusted by the, the Batista regime. He, um, 1953, what happens is he and a, his merry band of revolutionaries who uh, um, as I say, were nationalists at this point, uh, tried to seize an army barracks and uh, where there was weapons being held so that they could continue their struggle against the government. They're, of course, apprehended, put on trial. Um, Fidel Castro was sure he's going to be executed. Uh, he gives a long-winded speech, one of the great speeches. You know, you think of all the great speeches that are made by leaders in history, whether it be Louis Riel and Regina, or Gandhi made some great speeches, even bad guys made good speeches, Adolf Hitler in the Beer Hall Putsch, and of course here Fidel Castro in 1953. And what, you know, the line that stuck was, he says, do with me what you will, because history will absolve me. Absolve basically means that history will prove me right. You can condemn me now, but a time will come where, where people will realize that I was on the right side and that Batista was on the wrong side. He sent him to exile in 19, and you know, they should have just threw, threw him in prison. Instead, they kicked him out of the country. I think he ends up in Mexico, and from Mexico, he begins to build his movement again. And uh, he would return in 1956 when he would begin his guerrilla campaign. He was actually in Mexico where he was introduced to this fellow here, uh, Che Guevara. It was an Argentinian doctor who had recently, I guess he just finished medical school, and he and a friend did a motorcycle trip all around South America. And that motorcycle trip uh, really taught him how incredibly poor and hopeless people's lives were, and it really radicalized him. And he ended up driving through Latin America. He was in uh, Guatemala, I believe, during the 1954 coup d'etat against uh, Jacobo Arbenz who was a socialist who was implementing land reform. He was overthrown by the CIA, and he, Guevara was quite disgusted by that. And of course, by the time he gets to Mexico, he's, he's now fully radicalized, and he's told, hey, you got to meet this Fidel Castro guy. You guys have totally hit it off. I mean, they're both strong personality. They're both good-looking. They're both charismatic. And I think when they met each other, it was like, wow, you know, they connected right away, and I think at that point, uh, as soon as they met, Guevara gave his full commitment to stand by uh, Castro in his attempt to get back to Cuba and overtake uh, the Batista government. He would defeat Batista uh, in 19 uh, and take power in 1959. Now, of course, there's quite a story that occurs between when he arrives in 56 and 59, but in a super straightforward narrative here, because there's so many details to go through. Um, he basically went up into the Sierra Meister Hills and they built ham radios, he and his group of followers, and they would send signals down into Havana and other of the major parts of the island, and actually young people came to them 
So his revolutionary movement was very, very much a grassroots movement. It was not a top-down Hungarian Soviet installed type of situation. This was very much a peasant movement. Um, and a lot of intellectuals joined in his movement. Where in 1959 he had quite a number of people who were willing to go down into the streets of Havana, and I think it was New Year's Eve, was it? New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, 1959, I think is when he walked into Havana, and the Batista's army just fell away. A lot of them joined Castro, and Batista fled the country. So really, it was a relatively, it wasn't as bloody a revolution as something like the American or the French or even the Russian revolutions as well. So his goal at that time were to nationalize sugar mills and U.S. owned companies. So his number one goal right away was to strip foreign interests of their ability to what he thought was exploiting Cuba put those things under Amer uh, Cuban control, therefore all the, province, all the profits rather that are produced by the things that are made in Cuba go right back into the system to feed people, to create education programs, to create a medical system and so on and so forth. And essentially that should be the idea of a socialist communist economy, that all the wealth produced is filtered directly back into society to enrich the whole, if you will, of the society. Sounds idealistic, probably a bit naive, but in principle that's the way it should work, I suppose. Whoops, last one. He wanted to end corruption, he wanted to end prostitution, and he wanted to end uh, a gambling from America's playground. So, uh, he basically wanted to clean it up. He found those elements repugnant and so did most Cubans. Now right away, the Americans see a guy, tall guy, good-looking guy with a beard, in khaki uniforms and a military hat, smoking a big cigar, and they see red right away. Uh, and particularly when you nationalize, that's one of the hallmarks of communist societies, is to put industry under government control. So, um, the Americans saw red right away. They feared Castro's increasingly socialistic policies. The Eisenhower and then the Kennedy governments both were under a lot of pressure from business interests who had lost their, their, their companies through nationalization in Cuba, particularly oil refining companies. In 1960, the U.S. stopped buying sugar, so it was kind of a way of punishing them for what they were doing. Well, you're going to nationalize American-owned companies. We're going to stop buying your sugar. Later, cigars would be added to that. By October of the same year, all trade was ended. The Americans were not buying anything from Cuba, and Cuba could not sell anything. They were, the Americans wanted to bring this Castro government down to its knees. January 1961, they cut off complete diplomatic relations with Cuba. Now, there's a very interesting story that a man named Teddy Sorensen told on the Johnny Carson show many, many years ago. I'll never forget him telling this story because I just thought it was a great story. Teddy Sorensen was John F. Kennedy's speechwriter. I believe he's the one who is responsible for writing many of his great speeches um, over the years. But uh, anyway, Sorensen said that just before the full embargo, I guess Kennedy had asked, uh, uh, had called Sorensen into his office to give him this very important mission. He said, look, Ted, I need you to go down to Havana, ASAP. Uh, the embargo is coming in at 48 hours, so I need you to go down there and uh, buy as many cigars as you can. Because if you're a cigar aficionado, apparently, you know, I don't know because I don't really smoke cigars, but apparently uh, Cuban cigars are the best. So Sorensen very, very loyally went down, flew into Havana, bought these crates of guitars, or guitars, uh, cigars, comes back to the Oval Office, rolls these things on on a cart, clunk. Mr. President, you have your cigars, and John F. Kennedy's response was this, the embargo may now begin. So, he got his Cuban cigars before the full embargo. Basically, the Americans hoped this would starve Castro into submission, but it also had the opposite effect, because by trying to squeeze Cuba, Castro could mobilize the Cuban people by saying, look what these Americans are trying to do to us. They're trying to destroy our economy, our young revolution. We need to stand strong. Um, this policy drove Cuba closer to the USSR and encouraged Castro to adopt Marxist communism. Now, did 
Castro know about Marxism? Of course he did. He was a trained lawyer. He was no dummy. What he realizes is that the Americans want nothing to do with him. The Soviets halfway around the world are going, hey, 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 Fidel, Mr. Castro, we'll buy all your sugar. We'll buy everything you got to sell. Plus, we'll sell you oil and everything you need below market cost. What do you think Castro's going to do? You know, I mean, let's face it, the Soviets were playing politics too. They were looking for friends. They loved the idea of having an ally 90 miles from the shore of the United States. So getting involved in Cuba was just the perfect way of sticking it to the Americans. So they were quite happy to support Castro. And Castro was quite happy, you know, to be, uh, to be sort of um, brought into this camp because after a while, he kind of thought, well, you know, what I'm doing is socialist anyway, and that's kind of where my heart lies. So he basically throws himself in hook, line, and sinker into the Soviet Union. And of course, now the Americans are losing their minds over this. Well, you know, the plot continues to thicken, and you get some really great histories written about this period, CIA involvement, the mob, the connection with the Kennedy assassination, and so on and so forth. But we're going to we're going to look at these things in stages. You have to keep in mind that when Castro took power in 1959, there's a very, very wealthy group of Cubans who obviously fled the revolution because they were not interested in giving up their property and wealth to the state. So they left, they went to Miami, and they're sort of like the, the expatriates or the, the, the Cuban nationals who basically hunkered down in Miami and uh, were waiting for the day when Castro would be overthrown and they could return to Cuba and live their lives. They're still waiting. 65 whatever it is years later so but this is the first attempt to actually overthrow Castro US supported Cuban exiles to overthrow Fidel Castro um, the plan was approved in April 1961 by John F Kennedy who become president in January officially of 1961 with CIA activity and help from the mafia now how the heck does this happen well, there might not have been direct communication, but uh, the mob was just as keen as the CIA to get Castro out of there. So they were kind of working behind the scenes um, to get this done. The exiles believed Cubans would support them, so there was such a powerful anti-communist campaign and understanding from the Cuban exile position in Miami that they just thought he was such a tyrant that, that, that when they arrived everyone would rise up and overthrow this cruel dictator. Um, the 1400 exiles were swiftly defeated by the 20,000 Cuban troops, I mean if that's not lopsided I don't know what was, directly led by none other than Fidel Castro himself. The exiles miscalculate, Castro had mass support um, you know, and the Americans had a hard time coming to terms with this, whether they liked it or not. Castro was extremely popular with the vast majority. Were there malcontents? Of course there were. But most of the people that didn't want to stick around to see this communist experiment in Cuba left, right? So, you know, he had mass support. Uh, the imprisoned exiles later traded for baby food, you know, and this is once again propaganda at its finest where you know, he released, Castro releases these captured exiles and they can send them back to Miami. He says, we'll give you guys these exiles. No, we don't want rifles and mortars and bombs. We want baby food. Uh, you know, so what's he doing here? Sure, Cuba could have used baby food, but there's obviously propaganda benefits of claiming that the only thing you want to do is feed your children. So, anyway. Uh... This solidified Castro to communism, who in December 1961 would ask Khrushchev for arms to prevent an attack. So this, I think the Bay of Pigs and what happened here is really important in understanding why and how the Cubans could get to a place where they're actually having Cuban or Soviet missiles installed on their island. Okay, So every time the, Cuban, the Americans demonstrate their, their desire to destroy this government, whether it be through military um, invasion or through embargo and, and all these things, or quarantine, the more that pushes Castro to say, well, I'm going to throw my lot in with the Soviets because they're willing to give me everything I need and want. And uh, so, you know, now we can't blame the Americans for this, 
Um, they were part of it, but maybe the Americans were reacting too sternly about this. Maybe if they had a bit more thought, they could have found a way of establishing diplomatic relations with Cuba and, and making sure that Cuba made, stayed in the orbit of the Americans. Uh, it would have required a great deal of compromise, but I think all of this stuff could have been prevented. But either way, now Castro is convinced that it's only time before the Americans invade again, so Khrushchev said, hey, we'll throw a couple nukes on your island for defense, which leads to this. Uh, the USSR would benefit from a base in the Americans. Khrushchev hoped to encourage the U.S. to remove missiles from Turkey. This is another part of the equation that is often overlooked in this narrative. The Americans had a, a nukes stationed in Turkey, which bordered on the Soviet Union. So within a couple of miles, they were on the Soviet border. And the Soviets really resented that. And so they're thinking, well, if you've got missiles in Turkey aimed at us, we want missiles in Cuba aimed at you. An eye for an eye, right? But as Gandhi once said, an eye for an eye will make the whole world blind. So all this nonsense comes to no good in the end because nobody really wins. The other reason for Cuban, uh, the Soviet desire for the missiles in Cuba was to intimidate JFK, of course. In August 62, U.S. spy planes spot missile sites. In October, spy planes took photos of medium-ranged ballistic missile sites. So now the Americans, just like the U-2 spy plane of Gary Powers or the Soviets, the, the Americans are doing the same snapping pictures. And when they look at these pictures, they realize that they're seeing medium-range missile sites. On October 19th, JFK put a naval blockade on Cuba. Now, John F. Kennedy, he had a heck of a, you know, the, the, the military elements in his cabinet are saying, get in there and carpet bomb the place. You know, if you bomb a place where there's nuclear weapons, the fallout, I, it's just not realistic. So the Hawks will call them. The Hawks are saying, get in there and bomb Cuba. The Doves are saying, ah, come on, let's negotiate. We don't want to they, they break it out into war. So Kennedy decides to basically quarantine Cuba, or basically prevent any ships, Soviet ships, entering Cuban waters any further. So that's what they put in the naval blockade. And basically the 13 days of October, or whatever it is, I think it's 13, I'm pretty sure it is anyway, uh, is that period where people are waiting to see what is going to happen when these Soviet ships actually finally arrive and are stopped by American ships from, from entering Cuban waters. That's what people were afraid of, that when that moment came there was going to be a fight and then nuclear war. So, On October 26th, Kennedy receives two separate messages from uh, Khrushchev, one early in the day and one later. The first one was like, you better, you know, watch it because you know, if you do the ABC, you're going to have hell to pay. The second message said, look, this thing's gotten out of control. we got to hammer out a deal. Let's get on the phone and fix this problem. So Kennedy brings these two messages to a cabinet meeting. And there's all his military guys, his hawks, his doves. There's his brother, right, uh, the Attorney General, Robert Kennedy. And he approaches his cabinet. He says, look, guys, i got these two messages. This is the first one. Uh, an aggressive one, and here's the second one, a conciliatory one. When he reads the aggressive one, of course, the hawks in the cabinet go, bomb him, bomb him. When he reads the conciliatory one, the doves say, hey, he wants a deal. Let's cut a deal. Let's cut a deal. And there's bickering and fighting and blah, blah, blah. And eventually, Robert Kennedy, his brother, puts up his head and says, Mr. President, I believe I have a solution. Robert Kennedy very cleverly says, why don't we just respond to the second message and ignore the first one and pretend we didn't even get it? Oh, great idea. Don't acknowledge the aggressive one and respond to the conciliatory one, which is what happens. And from that point forward, the, the missile crisis comes to an end. JFK replies to the conciliatory message, U.S. promises not to invade Cuba if the USSR removes the missiles, which they do. So, nuclear war was averted. Um, closest we ever came, I think. Uh, and uh, I don't think we've ever come that close since, at least not that I'm aware of. 
Khrushchev claimed he had achieved the aim of preventing an American invasion, which is true. Cuba was now free from the worry of an American invasion, at least an overt invasion. There were many, many attempts by the CIA to have um, Fidel Castro killed, whether it be by cyanide or exploding cigars, all kinds of creative ways. Uh, the, guys, the guy had more lives than a cat, actually, uh, Fidel Castro. JFK increases his popularity around the world by avoiding war and getting Russia to back down. Cuba remains a communist state to this day, even in the age of Trump. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting because when Obama came in, there was a thaw, there was a, a recognition, there was an opening up, and then when Trump came in, he shut the door on Cuba again. So, uh, But they remain a communist country. As a result of this lesson, though, a direct line from Washington to Moscow was set up and a nuclear test ban treaty is signed. The period known as detente grew out of this crisis. And uh, from that point forward, from 1964, uh, to roughly 1979 80. There's a general thaw in Soviet and American relations. There are attempts to kind of uh, be a bit more friendly, but then when Reagan comes in in 1980, there's a sort of re acceleration of that Cold War anti communist mentality. So, anyway, that being said, I want to thank you again for coming to my uh, series or watching my series on YouTube. We will be looking at uh, the latter part of the Cold War uh, in the next series, and we'll also be looking at other themes in American history from the Civil Rights Movement to Vietnam and many others. So thank you again, and we'll see you next time. Cheers.